Hi, I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about regression. In particular, we'll be talking about how you can interpret regression p-values as Bayesian posterior probabilities. As usual, there's a link up here to the overall playlist all about regression, and a link down below to a PDF version of these slides. All right, so as a reminder, right, regression, multiple regression in particular, ha has this kind of model structure. We have response variables y. They are independent, normally distributed with a mean and a constant variance sigma squared. That mean uh, depends on a set of explanatory variables through the linear equation on the right hand side here. So that mu i is equal to beta naught, that's the intercept, plus beta one, a coefficient for a explanatory variable x one, plus so forth and so on until you get to the last explanatory variable xip, and that has a coefficient beta p. All right, so in this context, we can construct p-values for a particular hypothesis test, and most statistical software defaults to giving you or providing you with a particular hypothesis test. The one that is typical in software is this hypothesis test right here, uh, actually a whole collection of them. You'll notice here that I have a beta j, and the idea here is that j could be zero or one or two or all the way up to p. So we'll have a whole set of these tests. The null hypothesis says that this is the model rate up here, but that particular beta is zero. All the other betas are non-zero. And then the alternative just says that that beta is also non-zero. Now, if this is the hypothesis test, this is a two-sided test, we can construct an appropriate p-value for this test. Uh, we can calculate it right here. So it's just two times the probability that a t random variable is greater than the absolute value of the t statistic. The t random variable is gonna be a standard t. It has n minus p plus one degrees of freedom. That p plus one, as a reminder, is just the total number of betas that are in this equation up here. And since we started with zero and went up to p, there are p plus one betas. So we have n minus the number of betas in terms of our degrees of freedom on that t random variable. The t statistic is just the estimate of the parameter divided by its standard error. Okay, so that's how we construct uh, this particular two-sided hypothesis test and the associated p-value. As a reminder, small p-values indicate evidence against the null model. The null model here is the model that has this particular parameter, beta j equal to zero, but with all the assumptions that are up here. So having things like independence, normality, uh, constant variance, and all of those uh, assumptions come together to form our particular model. So if you get a small p-value as evidence against that model, you definitely want to go and check your diagnostics and make sure that uh, you don't see anything else that's problematic within the model uh, in, before you conclude that it's really just that beta j is not, not equal to zero. Okay, so here's an example output uh, from an R, a model fit in the statistical software R. This output, uh, it doesn't really matter what model it is, but we can see that there are uh, four different lines here. That means there are four different betas. We have an intercept, that's the beta naught. That's the dummy variable for conditions being slow. We have the next line down is the log of net to winner. Net to winner was a dollar amount, so we have the log of that as an explanatory variable. And then the last line is the interaction between those two terms. Uh, feel free to see that video that hopefully there'll be a link up here for that uh, talks all about interaction. But basically all we have to do is uh, multiply the dummy variable from the condition slow and that log net to winner, those two explanatory variables coming together, multiplication uh, to construct that term. Now, for the purpose of this particular video, what we're really focused on is this p-value column. So it's the last column uh, in this table describing um, this the model fit here. So we'll be using that column and we'll also be using the estimate column. So those two columns are the ones we're focusing on for the purpose of this video. Now, we also talked about Bayesian posterior distributions for parameters. So I just want to remind you that for each of the beta j's, there is a t posterior distribution with the same degrees of freedom that we've seen before. The location parameter is the point estimate for the beta, just like we had before. And the scale is just the standard error of that beta j. So all terms that we're very familiar with. Now suppose that what you're really interested in is calculating under this posterior distribution, say, what's the probability that the parameter is greater than zero? All right, so beta j has a t distribution. It's a non-standard. Uh, it has this location and scale parameter. And so we can standardize it by simply subtracting the location, dividing by the scale. So we'll do that on both sides of the inequality. 
So there we go, we've done it on both sides of that inequality. Now the key thing is, on the left side of the inequality, we have standardized the t distribution. So now on the left side, we have a standard t, and on the right side, we have something that looks very similar to our t statistic that we saw a couple slides ago. The only difference here is that we have negative t instead of the t. So we can rewrite this probability as a probability that a random t with n minus p plus 1 degrees of freedom is greater than negative of that t statistic. Now this should look very similar to our p-value. There's the p-value, where we just have two times a probability that looks similar, but we also have this absolute value sign. And so as we think about how we can take these p-values and interpret them as posterior probabilities, we need to account for two things. The first one is that we need to divide by two to get to the posterior probability. But then secondly, we need to understand how to deal with this absolute value. And so to get toward that idea, uh, I show here two possible posterior distributions for the same beta parameter for a regression. And the key is that the way these are constructed, they will have exactly the same p-value for the test that I mentioned earlier. And the reason is because if you look at under these two curves, the areas that are right and left of zero, then you get the same quantity. So not in the same direction. So let me just describe what I mean. If we focus first on the left, uh, left posterior distribution, that's the red one over there. And in first, you'll notice that we have a negative estimate for that parameter, right? The point estimate is the uh, posterior mean or location, really, of a t distribution. And that location parameter is the same as the mode because the t distribution is symmetric. So where that red curve has its highest point, that's the point estimate for that parameter. And you can see that it's less than zero. Uh, in contrast, the blue dashed lines have a positive point estimate. Okay, so now if we take that red curve and we say, well, what's the area that's greater or uh, above zero under that curve? That is, what's the probability that that particular parameter would be greater than zero? The area we get is this black area right down here. In contrast, if we looked at the right curve and we said, well, what's the area left of zero? That's the area left of zero. And hopefully you can convince yourself just by looking at this, that's exactly the same area. And so when the p-value calculates its probability that t is greater than the absolute value of t, it's going to come out the same here for these two curves. Now, if you multiply it by 2, you'll find you get exactly the same probability in terms of the p-value. Okay, so what this really tells you is that as you think about how you need to interpret the p-value if you want to convert it to a posterior probability, you also need to know whether the point estimate is below zero or above zero. And depending on whether it's below zero or above zero, you have to do a slightly different calculation to convert those p-values into posterior probabilities. So uh, here's that test we have, the two-sided test, and suppose that we have a p-value for that test. So the way that we're going to convert back to posterior probabilities or to posterior probabilities is this way. So if that point estimate was negative, right, so the beta hat is negative, then we're going to calculate the probability that the beta is greater than zero is equal to p divided by two. If we go back to the picture here, hopefully that idea is, let's see, I got it back one more, there we go. So the red curve is the point estimate is less than zero. And now we're calculating the probability that we are greater than zero, that's that gray area. Well, that's exactly the p-value divided by two. So that's how we get to this equation right here. Now we have exactly the opposite situation if the point estimate is positive. If the point estimate is positive, then the probability of being less than zero is the p-value divided by two. Now, uh, I like to think sort of more positively. This is going to give you sort of typically small values. And so a more positive approach is to say, you know, we can take each of these inequalities and we can flip them around, right? Because we know probabilities have to sum to one. So we just get one minus that probability. So here's an example. So if we want... If the point estimate is less than zero, then probability that the parameter is less than zero is equal to one minus the p-value divided by two. In contrast, if the point estimate is greater than zero, we just take the probability that that parameter is greater than zero is one minus the p-value divided by two. And so it's this way that we can use to convert our p-values into posterior probabilities. And you'll note that they depend on the point estimates being positive or negative and the value of the p-value. All right, so going back to our example here, where we had that uh, 
data set that who knows where it even came from. I mean, I know where it came from. It showed it on the previous slide, I believe. Um, but more importantly, what we're interested in is just taking these p-values here and converting them. So you notice that in our results, we have three out of the four parameters are have point estimates that are positive. One of those, the coefficient for conditions slow, has a negative coefficient. And so for the most part, we're going to be using the last line on the previous slide, but for that second parameter, the beta one, we're going to be using the version where the point estimate is negative. And so all we're gonna do is we're going to divide the p-values by two and take one minus those p-values and then use the appropriate inequality. So for instance, the intercept says, this p-value tells us the probability the intercept is greater than zero is about one. The probability that the coefficient for condition slow is less than zero is about 0.99. The probability that the coefficient for log net to winners is greater than zero is approximately one. And the most interesting of the bunch, the coefficient for the interaction term uh, the probability that coefficient is greater than zero is about 0.9. All right, so I tried to get you the idea here in this uh, video about how to take the p-values to get from regression output and convert them into Bayesian posterior probabilities. And I did that because for me, I think that Bayesian posterior probabilities are much easier to interpret than the p-value trying to sort of reject the null, figure out what that means. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this video. The next video, we'll start talking about ANOVA, or Analysis of Variance. Hope to catch you there.